And I have a bunch of delaminations. I have to just continuously start folding this billet and trying to. Forged in Fire is a TV show that originally aired in 2015. The show focuses on experienced bladesmiths who battle for a prize of $10,000. There are different challenges with every set of new contestants, and the show is constantly evolving as it goes on. However, with any show dealing with weapons, it has some sketchy parts to it. Welcome to Film Trip. In this video, we're going over 10 sketchy things you didn't know about Forged in Fire. Before we begin, remember to drop a like, hit that subscribe button, and wait to find out what number one is. Number 10. Most of the blades aren't so great. Watching a TV show where professionals work at a very high standard and create high quality items is very enjoyable especially when it's not a super common hobby, like handcrafting blades. However, sometimes things aren't so great. Sometimes the weapons that are shown are easily broken, ugly, or simply don't cut. Steve Calvert, the bladesmith behind Green Beetle Gear, decided to analyze the show's episodes. He determined that most of the failed weapons were due to very basic and fundamental forging errors. It's pretty strange that people so experienced would make these types of errors. While it is a TV show and its main purpose is to simply entertain, it's still a pretty strange and frequent occurrence on the show. Bladesmiths, this is the strength test, the wooden ramrod chop. To test the strength and durability of your edge, as well as the overall construction of your knives, I'll be chopping into this ramrod. And there she goes. Feel like a punch in the gut. Number 9. It's Controversy. While it's a weapon-based TV show, therefore you can't expect weapons to not be shown, it still has been under fire since its debut. After all, it does deal with weapons and their ability to kill. The show always shows the weapons cutting through things like dummies and meat, often in a very cinematic slow-mo shot, as if to almost glorify it. Because of this, the show has been under scrutiny by parents and police, as they think it could potentially spark a negative fire in some watchers. I'll deliver lethal blows on this ballistic dummy. Big, you're up first. You ready? Yes, sir. Let's do this. All right. Thank you. Paul, it's your turn. I'm ready. Number 8. The set is extremely hot. It's no secret that the set is extremely hot, and the producers often have to actually remind contestants to drink water, as if the conditions of forging blades wasn't dangerous enough, asphyxiation is actually a concern while on set. While this isn't necessarily the sketchiest item on the list, I do think it is actually a genuine concern. I cut my hand in a barnacle the day before I came here, and this gauze makes holding a hammer in my right hand extremely difficult. I have a bunch of delaminations. <laughs> I have to just continuously start folding this billet and trying to. Number seven, not everyone involved in the show is an expert. There's a large difference between being a bladesmith and a weapons expert. So on a show centered around being judged for your blades, you'd imagine all the judges would be bladesmiths. And that is true of three of the judges, Jay Nelson, David Baker, and Ben Abbott who all have impressive and extensive blade making experience. However, host Will Willis and Doug Marchiata came to the show with exactly zero bladesmithing knowledge. While the History Channel later made it very clear that Willis and Marchiata were learning about bladesmithing, it's still weird. Why hire people who don't have experience in the right field? Why not hire experts that deserve this chance to bring more attention to their skills and dedication to bladesmithing? Pennsylvania hanging out with Jay Nielsen. He's going to teach me and Doug Markaita how to make our first blades. You ready to do this, Doug? Ready to do this. Doug. Yes, sir. What do you think so far? Well, you know, I'm in moving the steel. I'm finding out that it's... Number six, contestants can't keep their weapons. It's pretty well known that the contestants can't keep their weapons. Why? Because it would be illegal for them to ever leave the set. They're just too dangerous. With this in mind, it can seem a little strange to sometimes show and break down the steps of how each of these weapons are crafted. While it's obvious that the weapons wouldn't be very effective if they're not made correctly, it can still be seen as a little dangerous. 
Some people dislike the show for glorifying dangerous blades and the fact that these blades are so dangerous that they're illegal to have. I think it can be fair criticism. Let's see what I can do. There we go. Today, it's my turn. I gotta turn this square piece of hot metal into a blade. Me and mine is quarter. We'll see how lethal your weapon is when I deliver multiple strikes on this big carcass. Zach, you're up first. You ready? Hell yeah. Let's do this. Number five, the show and woman. It's not a secret that there have been a shortage of women on the show. Bladesmithing has often been seen as a very masculine thing. In season one, there wasn't a single female competitor. In season two, there were only two female competitors. Many people have criticized the show for this, and the producers and showrunners have all around been pretty quiet about it. In a response to this, Tim Healy was quoted in saying, I don't want to shoehorn in female characters for the sake of having female characters. While I completely understand the mentality behind that, there are skilled women in the field. It's one thing that if, during the auditioning process, it's clear that the best of the batch are all men and so that's who proceeds, but it's another thing if they specifically choose not to pick skilled women for whatever reason. To me, it completely depends which of those situations is the case. For now, I suppose all we can do is hope that more experienced women join the show in the future. And then open up your tools here. Am I being too bossy? No, no, keep talking. Hold her footsteps, you gotta let her press. There, yeah! I see I'll we'll file them and grind them into shape. Nice! Look at Rally Hammer. He's got a barrier with a vengeance. I just wanted to Number four, a fan started a fire. While it should be common sense never to try anything done on the show at home, it appears that that's not always the case. A man named John Gomez liked the show so much, he decided to forge his own sword. Unfortunately, the man didn't have the needed knowledge, tools, or techniques to pull it off, and he actually started a fire. A rather large one at that. His fire ended up burning down 30 buildings in New York. The man was charged with fourth degree arson and reckless endangerment. While you really can't blame this on the show, I think that it is a lesson that maybe they should push some sort of disclaimer to never try anything on the show at home. Number three, Jay Nielsen lets his kids forge blades. A Vice reporter once visited the set of Forged in Fire. While there, Nelson showed the reporter some videos of his kids forging their first knives. At this time, his kids were nine and 14. While I would be the last person to try and give someone parenting advice, it does seem strange. I mean, it's far from a secret that bladesmithing is a very dangerous line of work. So a nine-year-old dealing with hot metal, sharp edges, and hammers just seems like a bad idea, even if their dad is an expert. I didn't really learn under anybody. Uh, I beat my head against the wall a lot. When I was doing stock removal, I actually went to a small knife show in Pennsylvania. And probably around 25 years or so, I was always fascinated by knives and swords growing up movies in the 80s with the sword swinging and Conan. Number two, Left Field Pictures is suing Fox. For context, Forged in Fire is produced by Outpost Entertainment. Outpost Entertainment is a subsidiary of Left Field Pictures. In 2014, Left Field agreed to produce the first ever reality TV program for Fox Business Network. A few months later, FBN pulled out of the deal. However, during that time, Left Field had already started producing the show. So now, Left Field is suing FBN for $4.5 million. While we don't know much about the TV show that was being produced, pulling out of the deal was a strange move for FBN, especially considering how Left Field Pictures has some very popular TV shows to its name. Overall, the whole situation is just very sketchy. What's going on on their heads? They're out of their minds. Is that a good thing? No. No, it's not a good thing at all. And then face. You'll never know until you test it. Number one, the show's aim at a younger audience. While it's no secret to the producers that a lot of children watch the show, it's strange catering to them. An example of this is the final challenge and how it always involves a classic weapon. 
In it, the last two competitors are sent home and are given five days to forge. Once they arrive back, it's put through some serious testing. One of the hosts, Will Willis, then dramatically unveils the weapons from under a cloth. He then briefly describes the weapon's history. Usually, the weapons are only related to fantasy worlds. So, Will usually uses examples like Lord of the Rings or X-Men for context of the weapons. While it's a fact that adults can enjoy these films too, they are generally made for a younger audience. And while he uses these examples as context, it seems like pandering to young children. And it's understandable to want young people involved in your profession so that it continues to grow. It's still strange pandering dangerous weapons to children. Victor, unfortunately, today your blade doesn't make the cut. I'd like to invite you to shake our hands, shake your competitor's hand, and then please leave the forge. That was our list of 10 sketchy things you didn't know about Forged in Fire. Which do you think was the most suspicious? Let us know in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching Film Trip.